full meeting planned for November 17th, but he's going to tell us uh, at the end of the meeting a little bit about it. So don't leave. And then what I'm going to ask is if you have any questions. Uh, <laughs> That was supposed to get her on the hip. Um, write questions down. We'll do a Q&A at the end. Because a lot of times our speakers will answer your questions somewhere along the line in the talk. And so we don't really need to spend double time on them, okay? Um, I'm going to introduce them, but they're all going to tell a little bit about themselves, uh, who they write for, how they got into writing, uh, what they look for when they're wanting to do an article on an artist, okay? So with that end, we have Dutch Sayforth and Eric Isle, Mark Olson, Peter Jones, and I should have made name tags, I'm sorry folks, I didn't even think about it. So let's start with Dutch, because he's bold and brave, and he'll talk. <laughs> hey, thanks, Martin. Um, well, my name is Dutch, and some of you guys were here, heard before, um, I'm with the Westward, here at Denver, the Westward Weekly. Um, combination of a writer and a blogger. Things have changed over the last couple of years, so it's not really the same as what it used to be. Um, now the Westward has a huge online presence and a lot of things that, that go online that, that may not make it into a print issue. Most of the stuff that I do ends up online, which is kind of cool. It's easier to forward. And, you know, it helps to keep the, uh, the newspaper nice and current. And, uh, it's a pretty good situation. I've been there for a couple of years. So I was with a um, before that, I was with the, the, the local newspaper, the Colorado Music Buzz. I think a lot of you guys have seen that. And those guys are awesome. And I was with those guys for about three years. And I got my start, actually, oh, about 15 years ago, writing in fanzines. Like, you know, writing about bands I would see at parties and stuff like that. So it's, uh, I always thought it was kind of cool, like, you know, if, I always thought that if it wasn't for people, like, telling stories, then sometimes, like, certain things don't get discovered. So I always thought it was kind of neat, like, you know, if you could find something you thought was really cool, then be able to share it with people, and when you're a writer, you get that opportunity. And it's something I've always really enjoyed. Um, besides that, like, you know, like many of you guys, I was a musician for many years. I still, you know, mess around with that. My 15 minutes of fame, I played in a country band out of Nashville about six years ago and I uh, played the CMA Music Festival there and that was my 15 minutes of fame. But it was fun. Other than that though, I've grown up out here in Colorado. I've been here my whole life and, and uh, can't imagine living anywhere else. I thought your 15 minutes of fame was right now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Raise your hand if you can't hear me. Thank you. Smart ass. Um, my name is Eric Isle. I, uh, I write for Reverb, which is the Denver Post's online music presence. It's at heyreverb.com. Um, and I also occasionally write for the Denver Post itself. I, like Dutch, wrote for Westward for many, many years. Um, writing for Reverb right now, I focus strictly on local music, so Colorado-based musicians like y'all. Um, I write two weekly columns, one's called Steal This Track, which the Frozen Movement is familiar with, um, which offers free downloads of local bands' music, and uh, I write another column, weekly column called The Mile High Makeout, which is about whatever I feel like talking about related to local music. Um, how did I get my start? Uh, writing for an online magazine about ten years ago, before there was the word blog, but that's really what it was. Um, called Hybrid Magazine, still exists. Um, I started writing reviews for them way back then. Started writing about local music about five years ago. So that's it. Uh, Mark Olson, Denver Original Music Examiner, and that means that my focus is on original music. I am a songwriter myself, and that's what I appreciate. Um, if you're in a cover band, I'm probably not going to be the guy you want to talk to. But um, I'm also, uh, like I mentioned before, I'm an executive director of Musicians in Action, and basically both of these vehicles are just ways to help the original music scene in Denver. And uh, if you want to learn more about anything, just send me an email, and I'm pretty accessible. Is this thing on? Okay. <laughs> it is. I can it's, it's a reverb video. Very good. I'm Peter Jones. Um, I'm kind of a jack of all trades. Usually when I'm in East Colfax, I have a little bit of a sign that says, we'll write for food or beer. 
preferably beer. But, so make note of that. Um, I do many things. I write for a company called Colorado Community Newspapers where I write about a whole bunch of things. Uh, music being one of them. I'm a music critic for a little weekly that comes out in this neighborhood called Life on Capitol Hill. Also, I worked in radio for many years, um, music and talk radio, and I used to play music on talk radio, which was kind of interesting. Uh, I used to cover years ago, I used to write for Billboard magazine, I covered the Denver music scene for Billboard for about 10 years, covered an organization that I gather no longer exists called the Rocky Mountain Music Association. This organization I think kind of replaced that, which is great. Uh, then I transitioned into writing for some of the national music magazines and online things. I used to write for Goldmine magazine, which is a music collector's magazine. And, uh, freelance basically for whoever would pay me to do so. Music was always my preference. I also write about film, politics, and the convergence uh, of those particular areas of life. And um, what am I leaving out? That's sort of how I got into the business was, was bad luck mostly. I often rethink my decision to enter journalism, especially in this era where we have one uh, daily newspaper left. So, uh, don't know. I'm trying to figure out how to get out of it, actually. So, the, the idea is okay. Thanks. I'm not a musician, by the way. I can play three chords. Oh, I guess I am a musician. musician. The question, the question was, what do I look for if I'm thinking about writing about a band or, or if I'm looking to do a story? And it's pretty easy to answer that question, actually. It's, um, I like to discover new things that are awesome. And one of the, the best, one of the, the best things I've ever heard um, that anyone's ever told me would be my editor and uh, Eric's former editor at the Westward, Dave Herrera, said this. He said, good is the enemy of great. When you're good at something, that, that, that's fine, but it, it's not the same as being truly badass at something. And, and so many times, like, there, there's, there's thousands of bands. I, I think at last count there was something like 7,000 bands on the front range of Colorado, I mean, if you go to like the MySpace stuff and all that. And out of those 7,000 bands, I guarantee you about 6,000 something of those are mediocre at best. I like to be able to, to tell people about something that's just unbelievable. And I've seen a few shows like in the last five years that, you know, I still think about it. They still blow me away when I think about it. And being able to share that with other people is a really cool thing. So. The best advice I can give you is if if you really think that you've got something good that's going on, you know, introduce yourself. You know, like give me a card, like the, the, the nice young man back there gave me his card, I'm gonna go home tonight and check out his band. That's what it's all about. I love to, to tell stories and you know, also just like any other writer, I like to get like the big scoop, you know. If I get to be the first person to tell other people about something, then you know, that's awesome. Um, one of the things like that I'm really happy about, I had a chance to write a story in the Westward about a band called Pretty Lights, which is out of Fort Collins. This was about a year and a half ago, and it was the, the first major publication in the world to write about this guy. You know, long story short, this guy now sells out Red Rocks. I mean, as a writer, that's awesome to be able to, you know, get that scoop. So I'm always on the lookout for like things that are cool and things that are the next big thing. You know, like. That's, I'm always on the lookout for that kind of stuff. I, I, so, I, I think, um, like Dutch, I, I love a good story. Um, and uh, and I, think, I think it's something that's easy to forget because I think as, as artists, you're really excited about the art you've created. And you should be. But it's not a story. And, and, uh, and putting out a record is not a story. I think you'll agree. Um, putting out a record isn't a story. 
It's not. Um, it's a great. It's a great accomplishment. You should be proud of it. But it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, it happens all the time. It happens seven thousand times uh, on the front range. Um, so, so I have I have three P's to offer you tonight. Um, be professional. Be prepared. And be persistent. And I'll talk a little bit about what, what I mean by each of those things to give you some real concrete stuff. By be professional, I mean put your best foot forward, first of all. Um, present who you want me to think you are. Right? So make sure that your, your recording is where it should be. Make sure you've got a website or some other place where I can find your info. Bandcamp is great. Reverb Nation is great. Doesn't matter. Um, make sure you have a well-written bio. Make sure you're not sending me an email with a bunch of typos in it. I'm sorry, I'm a writer and I'm a snob about that kind of stuff. It's true. But like, really, a snob. Really. Um, as far as being prepared, um, being prepared means a few things. First of all, know who you're pitching. Um, know what they write about. Uh, you know, I get stuff all the time from bands from out of town. I don't write about bands from out of town. I write about you all. So. Know who you're pitching, know what they write about. If, if Dutch only writes about hip-hop, which he doesn't, um, don't pitch him your country band. Um, make sure that when you send me an email, you know, I recently had a band send me an email. It had the link to their bio, it had photos attached, it had links to download their record, their, their newest record. It made it really easy for me, right? And not only am I busy, but I'm also lazy. And most, most of these people, I would say, probably have day jobs. And they're busy and, I would argue, probably lazy also. Um, so so be, you know, be prepared to hand them, you know, hand me everything. That, that's going to get me excited about what you're up to. Um, uh, oh, but I also, I, I realized I just said send me links to your music. Um, that's my personal preference. Again, back to knowing who you're pitching. Some some writers really, really, really prefer to get that physical, and they're offended if you don't send them a physical. So, know what it is. If you never send me something physical, me personally, I will be thrilled. So, um, last one, be be persistent. Um, there's a few things. You know, I, again, we all have day jobs. We're busy and lazy, and don't forget that we forget. Right. So don't be shy about hitting us up when you've got something new going on, or hitting us up when you've got something really exciting to tell us. Um, you know, you're going to have to reach out more than once and, uh, and let us know what you're up to. Um, so those are my top, sort of top three highlights, and I'm happy to expand on that later, but I'll hand it to Mark. Okay. I'm kind of, a, kind of a hard ass about one thing, is that I believe that 90% of those 7,000 bands that are in Denver are hobby bands as opposed to working bands as opposed to professional bands and if Darwin's principles were in effect we'd, we'd solve that really quickly and everybody would be a lot happier but I'm on the little guy's side um, I think there's a very thin line between a band that can become a great band and a band that is pretty marginal and that's basically what what I'm all about, uh, trying to reinforce the music scene here. And so basically what I'm looking for is original music. I'm looking for people who, just like he's saying, you're going to write the press release yourself, you're going to send it to me yourself. I don't care if you have grammar errors or anything like that, I'm a writer, I can clean your stuff up. I'm going to put my thumbprint on it anyway, and I certainly don't want four or five other writers to produce the same garbage anyway, and I'm sure everybody else here feels the same way. So don't feel shy about getting your, your passion out there. That's the thing I want, is I want to see what your passion is. I also, you need to understand, just like Eric was saying, there's 7,000 CDs being produced. That's not a hook. Your hook is something else. Your hook is what you bring to the music scene, or your hook is what you're doing in your, per, your particular genre that nobody else is doing. Your hook is maybe you've got some great talent, your hook is you have a mission. How many bands here, by show of hands, have an actual mission? Make lots of money! You have a purpose. There you go. <laughs> Every single band in Denver, I don't care if you're a crappy band or a great band, you should have a purpose. That should come across because it'll come across in your live stage show, 
it'll come across in the, the authentic sound of your recordings. Yeah, um, it's going to be everything for you, basically, to be passionate about what you're doing. So again, you know, you, I have very low bar for printing stuff, but if, just like Dutch was saying, if it's not cool and exciting, I'm probably not going to print it, because why, you know what, here's the problem with the world, is that we're all broadcasting and nobody's receiving. And that sucks, and that devalues everything. It devalues the music industry, it, it belittles all of us, it, it uh, marginalizes what we're doing as artists, basically. And just, I'm probably going to lose track of what I'm saying, but... <laughs> There's a thin line between a hobby band and a working band and a pro band. And that thin line is just stepping up and doing certain things, like having a manager, like practicing at least three times a week. In fact, here, how many people are in bands? Can you raise your hands? How many of you guys practice three times a week? You can just drop your hands if you don't. How many of you guys have a, a manager? I don't even care. This could be a friend who's a manager. I don't care who it is. There you go. So you have a manager. How many of you guys have attempted to tour? Now, there, you still have your hand up then, right? Put it up there, man, be proud. Be proud, because there is such a thin line. I, I don't know, is Fire in the Asylum here tonight? There you go, Graham. Graham self-manages Fire in the Asylum. He books all his gigs, and that's all you need to do. Um, but he goes out and he tours his ass off, and the boy has a major passion. And that's all you need to get to that next level. And everybody who put their hands down could put them back up if you stepped up and done some of this stuff. And I know, I've got, I've got two kids, I've got a day job, uh, I've got it all. I know what that means. And so all I'm asking you is to understand, are you a hobby band? If you're a hobby band, you can still contribute something to the music scene. And that's what I'm looking for. Any kind of contribution you can make, I'm looking for it. Um, but what happens is, when we all kind of work together, we elevate everybody in the scene. We learn from each other. I do a lot of interviews. If you've gone on my website, you'll see I do a lot of band interviews. I've interviewed Meniscus. I've interviewed Born in Winter. I'll interview Fire in the Asylum here pretty soon. Uh, haven't interviewed Ironwood Rain. There's some great bands out there. Uh, but what happens in an interview, Ian Anderson is one of my favorite songwriters. And one time in an interview, he said, when I get stuck writing a song, sometimes I switch instruments, sometimes I'll play on a, a blade of grass. And you, know, you don't know what kind of a glimpse you're going to get from a band interview, no matter how good or bad that, how amateur or professional that band is. There are things that everybody can pick up that we can all learn from and utilize. And so that's what I'm looking for. So again, it's pretty easy. If, like Eric said, again, if you write the press release, there's a good chance you can get published, but you got You can't be lazy. You've got to do your homework, come up with the content, come up with the reason for what you're doing, get excited about it, have some passion about what you're doing, and chances are, um, you know, there's going to be a good reason to write it. I might even, I've got enough time on my hands in some ways that I can send you back something and say, hey, tell me why. Tell me why I should print this. And I'll, or I might ask you some questions and put it into more of an interview format, just because that's interesting for the reader, too. And the other thing when you're writing that press release is think about the reader. It's all about the reader. In any business, and your band is a business, and any business has to view it from the customer's perspective. So if it's not interesting to the reader, you know, it's just massaging your ego, what, what's the point, right? Especially if it's going to go into print. I just do crappy little internet stuff. But when it goes into print and you're spilling ink, there better be a damn good reason. It better be the cream rising to the crop to be printed in ink. It really should. Um, sorry, that was a little harsh. <laughs> You're discouraging um, us. Oh. So like I say, I, like, I love doing interviews, so if anybody wants to be interviewed, all you got to do is put the bong away. <laughs> put the bong away. And I will, I will send you questions. And if I don't get what I'm looking for, I'll send you more questions. But we want to make it a colorful interview and something that other people can learn from is basically the objective. Uh, you can also, you know, it's not that expensive to hire a press agent. And people should think about that. Has anybody tried to hire a press agent to write a press release for you? There you go, Tony. Um, it's something to think about. It might be your first baby step into walking into a more professional level of musicianship. Uh, am I taking too much time? Pardon? No, no, fine.
Okay, press kits. I think press kits are stupid. I really do. And I also think that MySpace, even though it's been abandoned, it is your press kit. And the nice thing about it is it's standardized. A lot of bands should utilize it better so that when somebody jumps on it, they can see the music, they can hear the music easily, they can see what you're doing, they can see your purpose, they can see all the shows you're playing, and it's got a purpose. So even though Facebook is your networking tool, MySpace, I feel like, is still your electronic press kit, and it's more than satisfactory. Who, who ha you know, how, have you guys had CDs that are piling up somewhere that you've never had a chance to listen to? I've had, sadly, I've had CDs I bought from bands that I loved, but I never cracked the, the cellophane on them. And it's sad, but that's where we're at in the world. So it's kind of like accept it and, and learn, you know, to, to take advantage of whatever you can take advantage of. The other thing is, you know, okay, um, I'll make this quick. Basically, a band is a business, and do you guys know sales skills, basic sales skills? Are you prospect, you qualify, you get out and you make presentations, you ask, you know, you ask for the sale. And that's exactly what you got to do for a press kit, is you have to figure out who is going to write about you, you got to find out who those writers are, and like Eric was saying again, you find out what they like and what they don't like, and you play up what they do like. You kind of kiss their butt a little bit. Um, but then you you try to meet them in person, like you're going to be able to do tonight. And don't be scared after this meeting. Come up and shake their hand and introduce yourself, and be proud that you're a Denver band because I applaud you for producing music. Um, just come up and introduce yourself to people. Give them your email talk about what you're doing and see if there's possibly an interest. Um, and then ask for it. If, they're, if they don't want to publish something about you, ask them what, they, what, what are they looking for. They'll tell you. I'll tell you. You know, we, we're all waiting for content and it's not that hard to, to, to provide it. Okay. Um, so, okay, one last line. Basically, you should all know this, you've probably heard this before. You can do anything that you want to do, but you can't do everything, right? So you got to focus. You, maybe a press release isn't the best thing for your band to do at this point in time. And that's the first thing you got to ask yourself is, what do I really want to do? How do I want to move my band forward? Maybe it's spending more time in the woodshed. Probably. Right? And so I wouldn't get too caught up in the press. But you should also know that working with the local press leads to more national press, and that's a natural cycle, so you should be willing to do that. And we, as local press, should be very receptive to you as musicians trying to bust your home and come to meetings like this and do things to reach out, and you should not stop reaching out, and I'll stop talking, so. Well, I agree with uh, much of what has been said so far, but I will add this, that um, I am a journalist first, a music journalist second, maybe. Um, I too really look for a good story in whatever I write. Just even having good music, that helps a lot actually, I would say. That, there could be a story there, but I'm really looking for the compelling narrative. I'm looking for interesting characters. I'm looking for dialogue. It's almost like a movie, maybe. It's, I'm looking for... It's just like anything else you read in a magazine or a newspaper. You look for some, especially if it's a feature, but it's, it's, it's non-essential in a sense. You want something that's interesting and compelling. That's what I look for. And sometimes musicians are smart enough to market themselves that way, and sometimes they're not. Sometimes the journalist is smart enough to notice it, even if the musician isn't. That does happen. I try to be pretty creative in what I do. I used to have a job here in town for Colorado Public Radio, which was the uh, local affiliate for National Public Radio. My main job there was to cover, you know, a lot of political stuff, and whatever else was going on. But I was kind of somewhat subversive too, that I would sneak in my music stories and I'd find excuses to do it, you know. So I'd find some really sort of interesting musician to interview them under the guise that it was newsworthy, you know? In my own subjective, you know, I was probably the only time, I think I was the only person to ever interview Jello Biafra for Colorado Public Radio, which was basically a classical music station. So, 
And there were a few people who got to know me there who kind of took advantage of that, which was great because it relieved my boredom significantly. I'm rambling here a bit, but basically I'm saying music journalism is not unlike any other form of journalism. And I've done it all, except sports. I, if you send me to a football game, I would be, it would, it would be really sad. But I've done politics, lifestyle, music, film. The Denver Film Festival is coming up, which I'm very excited about. There's a big music thing, component of the film festival, you may know that. You may want to look into that. There's a nightly, late night music set. He knows more than I do. Exposure Music Lounge. And it's a great event, so check it out. But, um, where was I going with that? Um, yeah, I, I've done all the different kinds of music, uh, all, journalism. And to me, some may disagree, but to me, music journalism is no different than any other form of journalism. It still takes compelling stories. That's what I look for. I don't, do, I don't just do local music, I do national artists as well. But I kind of have the same standard for local and national. Interesting characters, interesting story. Hopefully good music, but I'll give you an example. Uh, I interviewed Ramblin' Jack Elliott a while ago. He did a show at Swallow Hill. And I interviewed him not because I like his music, I actually don't like his music very much, but he was such a compelling character and had such a compelling story to tell that I couldn't resist the temptation to interview Ramblin' Jack Elliott. And he, believe me, he earns his name. The guy rambles until you tell him to leave. So, those are my thoughts for what they're worth. Dutch, you got any more to add to that? What you're looking for? I wanted to I wanted to add in a couple things because these guys inspired me to talk about a couple other things if you don't mind. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, one thing, uh, kind of, and this kind of goes to back to the be professional comment that I made earlier, is be ready for press. In other words, it's not always a good thing for a band that isn't ready to get press. <laughs> and uh, I hear assent from the guys around me. If you're if you're not ready, keep working at it. You know, Mark was talking about spend more time in the woodshed. Like, sharpen that saw, right? So, if, if you come to me and your band's not ready, and believe me, no harm, no foul, but I probably won't pay attention the next time, right? So, so work on your game first. The other thing that I was thinking about was sort of differentiators. Um, things that make a band stand out are things that do make a story. Um, something that I write about in the Mile High Makeout, the, the column that I write on Fridays for Reverb, is a lot about is bands that are doing something special. Um, and that might be working with nonprofits. It might be uh, doing something unselfish, right? It might, be, it might be using your music to advance some other cause, right? So that's a story, I think, for all of us. That's a, that's a story. Sorry, I, this microphone is really unidirectional. Um, uh, yes, that, that's really a story. Um, the other thing about, about differentiation is collaboration. Um, for me at least, reaching outside of your own art form. Stop thinking about music for a second and think about how music might interact with theater, might interact with dance, might interact with other performing arts, or might interact with uh, visual arts, for that matter. I just wrote about Melissa Ivey, some of you all know her, you know, who, just, who just did a collaboration with Lori Mays, who's an amazing painter, and an, an animator named Ryan King. Like, that's really cool, right? So. So think about ways you can kind of break outside the music ghetto and, uh, and do something a little bit different. I like what these guys said, and especially what Eric just said there. Like, you know, differentiating yourselves from all those thousands of other bands that are out there. Um, I'll give you a couple of, like real world examples. Um, one of the more interesting stories I've read in the last couple of years, I didn't write it, um, someone else did, was a, of a Boulder band called Sound Rabbit. Most of you guys are probably like, who the hell is Sound Rabbit? Sound Rabbit? Sound Rabbit. Okay. The neat thing about this band, and this band's been written, you know, quite a few times at this point by various papers around the Denver Boulder area. Um, the way that they differentiate themselves from all the other bands that are up there, they donate 10% of every dollar they make from every show, every CD that they sell, 
And every month they, they'll take that 10% and they'll donate it to a different charity. And they've done that since they started about three years ago. And that's kind of neat. That's a story. That's something worth writing about. I mean, their music is fantastic as well, but, but there's a lot of bands that have good music. But that's a pretty neat story. And there's, you know, like the Flowbots are another, for instance, of that. The Flowbots are, are a great example. They're a cool band, but they're not exactly groundbreaking. There, there's a lot of bands doing similar stuff. The Flowbots differentiate themselves. They have their own nonprofit, like a, a well oiled nonprofit, like a very, very successful one. Those are the sorts of things that the journalists get excited about because it's here you've got a pretty good band that's doing something really, truly extraordinary. And I'm not saying all oh, you guys need to go out and start your own nonprofit or anything like that. Please they don't. <laughs> but it could be as simple as, you know, maybe your band, like, you know, offers to, like, shovel snow off of, like, a senior citizen's driveway. I would write about that. You know, it could be, it, it could really could be anything. But I mean, like, being creative, you're already musicians, you're already creative people by nature. Give me something to write about. Just like Eric said, what Mark said, what Bill said down there. Peter, I'm sorry. <laughs> But give me something compelling. Give, give me a story to tell. Something else I would add is uh, I feel sorry for musicians because I'm a musician. And you have a lot of shit on your plate, basically. You've got to write music, you got to practice, you got to keep a band together, and we all know that most bands self destruct pretty quickly. Um, you got to do a lot of things. But on top of that, you really have to be the band manager, probably, if you're in that hobby band category. You've got to be the PR agent. You've got to be, you know, so many different things. You're, technically, you probably, you're, you're not paying any taxes. <laughs> but um, it's, there's a lot on your plate. So the first thing you really need to ask yourself is, do I really need press? Do I really need press? Should I bug Eric to write about my band? Unless there's a really, really good reason. You know? And, and you never know though, something might miraculously surface that it's like, wow, this is my purpose. And I should share this with these guys and see what they think about it. And you could, any one of these people sitting here, I bet, would listen and, like Peter was saying, it's, you're, he's looking for the color, he's looking for the narrative. You know, if you've got a story to tell, that's, we all do. Everybody has a story to tell. And the older we get, the easier it is to realize what that story is. But the younger you are and the sooner you figure out what that story is, if you really tell yourself, I've got a story to tell and what is it, uh, the easier it's going to be to share it. So. The other thing I might add too is I think everyone has a story to tell. Even if they don't know what that story is. I mean, I used to do talk radio and I would interview people who really didn't know what their story was until they got through the microphone. There were a few that didn't really have a story, I take that back. <laughs> but for the most part, everyone does. And I've mentioned a few different things tonight, kind of broader themes, but one thing I will say, you know, one thing that I do that I mentioned is I write a, a, a monthly music column for a little publication here in this neighborhood called Life on Capitol Hill. I, and uh, I shouldn't really reveal trade secrets this openly, but after a couple of beers, I'll say that it's not that deep, not that hard for me to write about you and life on Capitol Hill if you're persistent. So, if you're interested, if you're doing any gigs in the central Denver area, let me know about it, and um, you know, if you're nice to me, there's, there's a decent chance I'll write about you, so buy me a beer, that helps. So, it depends on what I'm doing. I, I wear a lot of hats, but for life on Capitol Hill, I'm, I'm pretty open-minded. And I, 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 what I try to do is find the interesting um, aspect of what's going on, even if it's not compelling at first glance. But anyway, um, so I would say that. I would say that. But generally speaking, as I said before, I, I think that musicians live interesting lives. I would bet every one of you has an interesting story to tell because, I mean, some of you probably have children, you've got house payments. And what's the craziest thing to do? Become a musician? I mean, why would anyone in their right mind do that? I mean, that's one question. 
So I'm sure you all have interesting stories. If you know how to tell that story, it's probably a story worth going to print or at least going online. And the internet is, you can't put too much stuff on there. Yeah, this was a, a, a great example of bad publicity. I can't even remember the name of this band anymore, I already forgot. But this happened just a couple days ago in Los Angeles. If you've ever been to Los Angeles, you know that there are highways, they're, they're, I mean, there's just no other way to say it. A ton of traffic. So this band, it's a, they were a hip-hop rock band, and these guys had like, you know, a big bus with their pictures, you know, blazing across this bus. And very tacky, by the way. These guys had the brilliant idea to drive onto the highway, park their bus, turn sideways so that they're blocking traffic on a freeway, and then they got up on top of their bus and started playing music. Not realizing, like, you know, this is, you know, people going to work and, you know, people were pissed. <laughs> to say the least, they tied up traffic for hours. Um, long story short, like, you know, this band is now in a lot of trouble with the, with the, with the cops out there. And, and universally, people think this was the stupidest publicity stunt of all time. And I, I have to agree. I mean, that, that's just got to be like one of the dumbest things you could ever do. Like, you know, if you're frustrating people or irritating people, then you're doing something wrong. Period. I mean, playing music is supposed to, you know, entertain people, not piss them off. So, that's a great example of a, please don't do that here in Denver. Are there any questions from the audience? We can, we, can, we can repeat the question, that's fine. Okay, I was going to say a good example would be like OK Go doing their, uh, <laughs> what do you call those things? <laughs> the exercise machine thing, they did that, and then they did one of those Ruth Goldberg things, and now I guess they've got another one out. They, they've gone viral over the internet, so you can be extremely creative but be entertaining and not piss anybody off. <laughs> so anyways, all right, I've got the wireless. We've got a couple of questions here. And so, Okay, I'm leading to being annoying. Um, when you guys talk about being persistent, I always joke about that. I'm a pit bull mixed with a retriever. I don't like down, but I don't let go. <laughs> Normally that way. <laughs> I know, that could be taken so I'm sorry. <laughs> Whoa. Is that what she said in a very comment? Yeah, probably not. But on a manager standpoint, my question is, how persistent is too persistent? Because that's one of the things I really struggle with. I'll call somebody every other day, and that's annoying. So now I'm going down to once a month, or once a week. I haven't gone to once a month yet. And normally that's okay, because it's always the, if I'm annoying you, please let me know, and I'll stop. And if you don't let me know, I'm going to keep annoying you. So how persistent is too persistent? When you get an email back that says, F you. <laughs> just or the restraining order. Stop. Yeah. Just pass that around. Pass that around. Uh, I would say since I said the, the since I said the thing about being persistent, have something new to tell me. So if you're telling me the same thing, like have you listened to my record? 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 Have something new to say. Have something new that you're up to because you are up to new things. And pay, and, uh, pay attention to what you're doing and tell me something new. That'd be my idea. Absolutely. And trust me on this. I don't think you or any of these people here could ever be as annoying as publicists are. And, when, and, and I think all these guys up here, like, some of you folks, like, you know, I think the advice was given earlier. Don't be afraid to hire a publicist to do your press release. Those people get paid to be annoying. Like, I will get phone calls, I will get emails, I will, I get bombarded by these people. And, and it, I take it with a grain of salt, but it is, you know, it does get to you sometimes when you got someone like just basically begging you to write about something that, that you hate. It does happen. Um, as far as being persistent, like, I'll give you guys, like, here's a, a real world story that this happened just this last week. Uh, there's a local band here in Denver, like a, a funk band, like they've got like eight people in this band, and a big band, they've been around for about six years, they're called Filthy Children. The singer of the band, Jenny Anderson, she also is the bar manager at Mead Street Station up in uh, the, the, the highlands of Denver. 
So, I was up at Mead Street about six months ago having some beers and listening to some local bands, you know, do the singer songwriter thing. And Jenny goes, like, you know, hey, are you ever going to write about my band in the Westward? You know, like, basically, I mean, she's like, you know, why, like, why is my band being ignored? She was right, she had a point. I mean, like, her band, like, literally, to this day, they play all over the region, from Montana down to, you know, New Mexico, so they tour hard. Every time they play Denver and Boulder, they pack the house with hundreds of people. That's a story. And she was absolutely right. Like, that her band had been being ignored by all media outlets. And meanwhile, while they're being ignored, they've got this huge fan base. People love this band. She had a point. And I told her, like, you know what? Let me know when you have a big show coming up in Denver. Because remember, I write for a Denver newspaper. So I, I don't write for a Fort Collins newspaper. So if you have a show in Fort Collins, that's awesome. I don't care. I can't do anything with that. But if you, if you have a big show coming to Denver, yeah, I want to know about it. Any story that goes in the paper has to be around an event or around something. Either that's a big show or you, you have like a new video or you've got, you know, maybe like you've got like, you know, a project coming up. I, I don't know, but it has to be around something tangible. So to answer your question, be persistent around something that's coming up that's relevant to Denver, at least in my case. Now with, with Eric's case, like, you know, he works for the Denver Post that covers a big part of the state. So it's different with Eric, but with me, if you get a big show in Denver, hit me up. And again, it's denverdrivebygmail.com. Please add me to your list. Let me know when you got something coming up. Well, if you're going to stalk me, I would prefer you do it via email. I'll, the phone calls get really annoying, I'll be honest with you. And um, you're likely to hear a little bit more of a tone in my voice if you call me off you know, every other day, as you said. Yeah. Um, the dial tone. I'll make an exception for you, but for the most part, do the email, because that way I can just hit the lead if I don't want to talk to you anymore. But I'm, pretty, I'm actually pretty nice and pretty, pretty polite person, so... Um, what the hell? But, you know, just be reasonable. Okay, we have another question over here. He remembers what he's going to ask. I guess my, my comment, or my question was kind of along similar lines. I think uh, that comment was a little more focused on being overly aggressive on, you know, like an individual one-to-one -one kind of level with a journalist. What about in terms of uh, just overall, like, are there dangers for an artist trying to get too much press? I mean, at what point are you trying to pursue too much press as an artist or as a fan? Uh, I, I kind of have something to say to that, Adrian, which is, uh, which is, which has to do with being, uh, with playing too much. This is just something that I, that, that's been on my mind lately, um, which is local bands that play too often. And it's tempting to take every freaking gig you can get, right? And I, I get that. And especially if you're trying to hone your craft, like, you want to get out there and you want to practice. I just, re I just recently wrote about a band, and they're, and they're a great band, they're very talented. But they have three shows coming up within ten days in the same neighborhood. They're playing Moe's, they're playing High Night, they're playing Three Kings, all within ten days. Don't do that to yourself, right? That, 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 that turns you into a commodity, there's nothing special about your shows. And I'm not going to come to any of them because I think you, I can always see you. And I'm, I'm, speak, I'm speaking as a music fan, not as a music critic, right? So, uh, so that's just one thing, is just being kind of too available. Um, see what these other guys have to say about it. I love that, actually. He's, you're totally right. There, there's an old cliche that says scarcity breeds demand. If you're, if I can, if I look at your calendar and you're playing all the time, well, what do I care? Like, well, I, I don't want to write about that. Like, what's special about that? But like somebody like the Warlock Pictures, perfect example. These guys are playing twice in one year after, what, 17 years of not playing? That's newsworthy. 
granted, the audience for that for that particular story may not be huge, but I mean, like that band was a big part of my life when I was 16, 17 years old. So the whole thing was scared, like Eric was saying, like you know, being scarce. I cannot stress this enough. Play as many shows as you want, but not every show needs to go on your website calendar. I mean, if you want to look professional, don't put all your restaurant gigs on there. You know, I mean, like it's that, that's it, it, it's not cool. I mean, I understand like you do things for money, and then you know you, you do things because you want to like you know build name recognition, and build a career. Well, you know, the scarcity breeds demand. Cannot stress that enough. Here, wait. I'll get to you though. Real quick, I have a term called social capital. Your social capital is your friends and your family. And like you say, with Warlock Pictures, you can tap your friends and family maybe four times a year. Two times a year would probably be pretty smart, but it's up to you. But in this economy, you have to realize that it's a two-way street, and your social capital is as important to the venue as whatever the venue is going to provide for you. There's just not there's not ears out there to magically hear your stuff. And it's like he was saying, the, the more elusive you are, chances are the more people will want to see you. The, I'll just drop this real quickly. The, uh, the next combo uh, seminar I'm going to host at is going to be called Turning Your Gigs Into Events. And every hobby band here should be thinking about coming to this because it's basically about every time you go out and you perform, it should be a major event. And there should be a very good reason that your social capital is coming to see you. And there are so many bands that just love to go out and play, play, play. That's why we have Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. These are called open mic nights, and that's when you cut your teeth. And that's when you go out and you just get out for the hell of it and get in front of a crowd and you don't bug your friends too much because they've seen this stuff. And they're like, oh my God, you're going to play that song again? You know? Don't you have anything new? Has anybody heard that? Do you got any new material? So, you know, be kind of, you got to be respectful of your social capital. And if there's nothing wrong with playing an open mic, right? But, again, the cream rises to the crop, and really, there's a thousand bands to every venue here in Colorado. Seven thousand, I think that's a conservative number. Um, Probably. There's about a th I think there's a ratio of a thousand bands to every venue, and that means that the cream has to rise to their crop, the top. And, uh, basically, Friday and Saturday night ought to be blow our doors off, also, something else related to West Down is there was a measurement of original music in Denver. We're rated really high for the quality of original music here, but you wouldn't know it because there's a lot of people getting out there and talking their way into gigs that they shouldn't be doing. And you, get, you really ought to kind of step back a little bit, do a little bit of wood shedding, prepare your live show so that you have something that the audience wants to see. And unfortunately, that's another unfortunate thing is You've got to provide something that people want to see. It's just one more obligation you have. But you need to work at it and come up with a real material. And if you're really realistic about it, if you're a hobby band and you're realistic about it, four times a year is fine. Six times a year is great. You know, if you can squeeze a few festivals in and things like that after that, that's really what you ought to be shooting for in my mind. Well, my answer is it all depends. Um, if you're playing 25 gigs a week, that's kind of interesting. I might want to do a story about that. Because I don't know how you're doing it. And if you have a really enthusiastic audience, I'd like to see who those people are. So, I don't know, I just, I'm just looking for the interesting stories once again. So there, there, there are no rules as far as I'm concerned. It's just, is it interesting? If it's not interesting, I don't care about it. If it is interesting, I care about it. Uh, let me add, interject something here real quick. Rather than playing every month, every week in Denver, find a show in Colorado Springs and one in Fort Collins. That way you don't overplay your crowd. Actually, Monument, Monument or small towns, they love bands to come in. From a small town, they will pack the place because they're like, oh my God, there's some talent coming into our little town. Go up or go up to the mountains, that's what bands do. They go up to Keystone and Breckenridge and blah blah blah. 
and they pay you too. Um, can you go over the basics of a press release? of a press release and honestly so we don't waste time I would say Google it because there's so much information about it it's obvious I hate to say that but in my opinion it's pretty obvious just Google press release and you will find everything you need just like if you need to fix your toilet Google how to fix your toilet and you can find it we live in such a DIY world that I, I say poo poo press release you're, you're wasting energy that you as a musician could be doing for something much more powerful. That's my opinion. <laughs> if you guys want, if, if any of you guys email me, I will be happy to forward you press releases from well-known publicity agencies like Madison House, Tsunami. Shoot me an email if you want to see like what, what we get, what the big professional bands, who they hire to do that stuff. I'll, I'll send one your way. It's not the trade secrets of China, so I'll forward it to you, you can check it out. Um, it'll be hopefully helpful to some of you people to see that. Okay, we'll go ahead and probably do one more question, Jim. Um, well, this is a, a paid, uh, paid political announcement for MIA. Musicians in action. Uh, as Eric was saying, if you want to do something special, please hook up with Mark. Mark does some incredible things around town. He has these events that he puts together for very deserving uh, not for profit organizations to put together great shows. It's stuff going on all the time. Right now, he's, uh, his next one, I think, is at Spillway on November, November 12th. November 12th, and, and, and for, for doing this plug for you, you're going to write about my band, right? Yes, yes. Just tell me all your time. No, actually, again, MIA is basically, it's, it's getting musicians, if you, if you want to volunteer at a homeless agency, you can, basically. Uh, the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless is building a temporary shelter, right, or a, a temporary housing, right here at Colfax in Pearl. The gathering place is at High Street in Pearl. The Empowerment Program, which is our, another one of ours, is up on uh, York and 18th Street. Senior Support Services is the homeless agency, it's the only day center in Colorado for homeless seniors. And if you want a life-changing, if you want ideas for a, a song, go to Senior Support Services and see some of these seniors. It's basically a cafeteria-style kind of environment where these guys come in there and they can get a couple free meals and they have a place where they can actually talk to somebody and get some help with their old age pension and different things like that. And those kind of things alone will change your life, but basically you're also going to get a paid gig, and you're going to have us as an intermediary, so you're not going to be waiting until the last drink is poured before the bar you know, before the owner pays you your cash and things like that. It's a very stress-free, easy kind of situation as far as that goes. But again, it just, by the way, Grant, Grant Pitt the show for us at Three Kings a while back. October 1st, we started a, a new thing where the bands are getting paid. So it's basically it's an incentive to bring your social capital to the show. Uh, that money before that was going directly to these agencies, but what we're doing is we're focusing on the show sponsors more so. And every, if you know about MIA, we do it collection drives at every show too. So we get them basic bare necessities. And frankly, that's what we mostly like to focus on because we know that's going to be used. And every one of the agencies we work with is dedicated to alleviating the causes of homelessness. I have one last question, and it's pretty basic. Since you're all in different mediums, what's your lead time for a feature? Lead time for a feature. Well, as soon as possible. <laughs> your, um, I guess, disorganization and tardiness on your part does not constitute a breaking news deadline on my part. But having said that, just, I mean, you don't want to send me a press release for something you're doing on New Year's Eve in uh, in July or August, but you know, it's hard for me to answer that question. Just be reasonable about it, I suppose. And, and 
email tends to get deleted after a while, so I would say safely, uh, for my, I guess to give you a serious answer, I would say a month out would be nice for me. Yeah, print journalists and online journalists have different, definitely d different uh, needs. Um, not more than a month out, I'd agree with Peter. Um, and, uh, but you know, it, it, it does happen, and I think Dutch, you can back me up on this. Sometimes a week's notice, and we're desperate for a story, you might just, you might just hit. It just might happen. That's the whole being persistent thing for sure. Um, for something to go into print in the westward, if you're curious, it's, I, I gotta know about it a month in advance. I have to be able to go to my editor and go, hey Dave, I'm working on this interview with such and such, or I got this, what I think is a great story, a month. I mean, minimum, sometimes longer than that. If I'm thinking about something like that's two months out, I'll tell my editor. I mean, it, there's so much uh, competition with all these contributing writers at all these publications, Denver Post, Westward, Boulder Daily. I mean, we're all in competition with each other. I mean, we love it when we get something that's a feature story. I mean, I'm stoked when that happens. Um, but there's so much competition, so at least a month. For something like online, like you know, the backbeat section on Westward, and I think probably the Seventh River, a week, two weeks is better. Three weeks is fantastic. You know, you know. Although, if you if you have some breaking news and if you know that it's a pretty solid story, I think any one of us would jump on it, right? Right. And we'd make the time for it. Yep. But you pretty much have to amaze us, and and you should. You should try to. If, if you're not, if you don't have anything amazing, why waste the time? Why waste everybody's energy? Just Practice your instrument <laughs> and, and think about it later. Okay, it's time for us to kind of fold up. Uh, I think we need to give them all a big hand. Dutch safe for it.